Um, so welcome, everyone. I'm really happy to um, see all of you here for this first um, part in our, our three-part series, Making the Invisible Visible, Hope and Action Amidst Challenging Times. My name is Frances Garrett, and I teach um, Buddhist studies at the University of Toronto. And I'm also the director of um, this really amazing program. I'm the new director this year of this program called Buddhism, Psychology, and Mental Health. And that's the host or sponsor of this uh, um, series. I'll put in the chat a link to our program if you'd like to learn a bit more about it. And I'm going to... Um, not delay any further and introduce you to um, Ellie Weisbaum, who is one of the professors in our program. Um, Ellie is an assistant professor in the Buddhism, Psychology and Mental Health program at University of Toronto. She also does a lot of other things. She's an instructor at the Applied Mindfulness and Meditation Certificate program at the University of Toronto. And she works at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto um, at, um, in the Mindfulness Project team member. As a, as a mindfulness project team member. So um, Ellie teaches in our program courses on socially engaged Buddhism, uh, mindfulness meditation, science and research and other things that, and her courses are very popular. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Ellie Weisbaum who will introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Francis, and uh, wonderful to see so many of you here. Uh, it's just wonderful on our end. We can see we have over 100 participants um, and the, the chat is open to say hello as well. A uh, big thank you also to the New College Initiatives Fund for funding this program. We're so grateful to be able to bring different voices in and explore this topic together. Um, and so I'm going to introduce our speaker who is uh, the first in our three-part series. So we hope that you'll be able to join us for more uh, dialogue and connection over the next few months, and we'll share those dates again at the end. Um, but I want to introduce uh, Kyra Jualingu. Uh, she describes herself as having a lifelong journey of weaving contemplative practice with social justice. She guides people to transform and heal through embodied presence, stillness, and play. She earned a BA and MA at Stanford University in Anthropology and Social Sciences with a focus on African diaspora and liberatory education for African American students. She ordained in the tradition of Thich Nhat Hanh and Plum Village and spent 15 years having a 24 hour a day mindfulness practice. This was actually when our paths first crossed. Um, on a personal note, uh, we have known one another for a long time in many different manifestations and spaces. Um, we have enjoyed meditation on mountains and delicious ice cream meditation. Uh, so it is just a joy to have you here today and reconnect in this space and around this topic and dialogue. Um, I also want to give a shout out that her book, we were made for these times, 10 lessons for moving through change, loss and disruption. I was published in 2021. On a personal note, I've been sharing this book, uh, sending this book to friends and colleagues whenever I think they need a kind of warm hug and invitation to come home to themselves. So thank you for this book. Thank you for your friendship and thank you for whatever is about to happen. Uh, I don't want to take up any more time. So just again, a warm welcome to you and also everyone who's in this webinar together. Um, I can't see all of you, um, but something brought you here today. And so in that way, I feel uh, very connected and grateful to be here. So uh, Kyra Jewell, please jump in. Thank you so much, uh, Ellie, and all of our friends and organizers at uh, University of Toronto. Just checking that my sound is coming through well for you all. Okay. Um, and yeah, it was really lovely to scroll through the names and, and see some folks that I uh, know and just uh, everyone, very, very warm welcome and really grateful to to be here as part of this, this series and um, looking forward to the other presenters as well uh, who come in the coming months. So I wanted just to let you know that we'll have begin with some reflections by me and then a lot of time for interaction with you at the end uh, in the sort of second half. So um, we'll, we'll let you know more about how we'll, we'll do that, but there'll be space for you to ask questions, offer reflections. Um, so I'll speak for about 30, 35 minutes and um, 
The time will be ours. So I love this prayer from the Dagara people of Burkina Faso that the elder who recently passed away, Patrice Maladoma Somme, um, has offered us. May all ancestors join forces to put good thoughts into our minds so that we may see the good that awaits us and accept it. So as we enter this field of um, considering what it means to cultivate hope and nourish our own ability to act in these very um, difficult and powerful times, It's really important to remember that we have a body and that we can uh, invite our body to help us and to really integrate what we're experiencing. Because we're experiencing this moment, this very stressful, anxious, unknown moment as bodies. And so to begin, I wanted to invite us to do a, a simple sequence uh, of movements of, of caring for our body, of self-touch to um, bring in our body to this conversation, to this exploration and to nurture ourselves. So this is a vagal toning, vagal nerve nurturing sequence. This, we know the vagal nerve is the largest nerve uh, in the body going from the brain down into the torso, affecting all of the organs and um, all the way to the pelvic area. So if we are able to bring ease and peace to this nerve, it has a, a powerful effect on our body and our mind. So if you're up for it, <laughs> we begin with the ears because the vagal nerve helps us to know if we're safe. So the first place we want to find out if we're safe is we listen to know if we're safe. So we're going to massage the, the edge the outside of the ears all the way down to the lobe. We'll do that three times. So just kind of rolling gently. It should feel good. The edge of the ears all the way down to the lobe. And one more time. We often forget about our ears. Great. And then we're going to bring care to our eyes. So if you're wearing glasses, you can remove them. We're just going to bring the, the fleshy part of the palm to cover the bones of the eyes, so not pressing on the eyeballs. So we're just going to invite the eyes to know that they're safe and to rest in our palms, to take a break from the screen, to take a breath or two here. Letting the eyes be bathed in this darkness. So after hearing, we, we look to know if we're safe. And the next practice is to bring the palms to our cheeks. Just holding your face, maybe as if someone who really cared about you would hold your face with a lot of kindness, gentleness, 
It's noticing how this feels. Taking a few breaths. Great. And we're going to move to the heart. So you can place one hand over your heart center, not your actual heart, just the middle of your chest, and then your other hand over that hand. Again, a few breaths, just offering yourself support, comfort. You could close your eyes if you want. Just feeling the touch of your hands. Maybe you feel the swell of your chest as you breathe. Slowing it down and bringing your attention into this marvelous community of trillions of cells that makes up your body. And here, neuroscientists have said, have found that if we tell ourselves in this posture, I am safe, the reptilian brain that gets afraid and reactive really can settle down. So just see what it would feel like to say to yourself, I am safe right now. And then we move our palms down to just an inch below the belly button. So it's the same position, one palm over the area, just below the belly button and the other palm right over that one. So the same, same way, but over the belly. And again, just feeling what it feels like to have your palms on your belly. Maybe you feel your breath down in your belly. Taking a few deeper breaths, maybe. And following this vagus nerve on its journey. Noticing how it feels to offer yourself this caring, mindful touch. And so the last movement or gesture is to turn our palms up and rest them on the thighs. So this is a kind of integrating what just what we just did, just taking stock. Again, resting back and just noticing what might have shifted, if anything, how those movements affected you. What's your body saying to you? And especially noticing if there's anything your body wants to do, uh, move, sway, hum, smile, stretch, wiggle, shake. Give yourself a moment to do that. Humming also can tone and activate and support the vagal nerve. 
I'm just going to take a deep breath. And then as I exhale, I'm going to let a hum happen. And you're welcome to do that or not. Thank you. It's always fun to, if the chat's open now, to just know if, know what, what that was like for folks. Um, you could put a word in, just check in how, how was that? Wonderful, so liberating, center, rejuvenating, releasing, decompressing, calming. Relaxed, peaceful, soothing, harmonizing, restoring, slowed down. Ease. Thank you for, for trying that out and for, for your reflections to connection. Yes, beautiful. So that's a very simple thing you can, you can do whenever you like. Uh, I learned it, um, I learned that it comes from Marty Glenn, uh, PhD, Marty Glenn. So thank you to Marty. And uh, it's encouraged to do it three times in a row. So you might try that if, if you like it. Do three, three sets. So starting with the ears, massaging three times, covering the eyes, holding the cheeks, the heart, and the belly. So it's five places. And then resting with your palms up. And then you do it again. And then a third time. So... <clears throat> So so how do we how do we take care of ourselves? How do we take care of each other? How do we take care of our our world in this moment of of great um, danger? So what can be so stressful in times of change, in times of challenge, in times where unexpected things are happening is this feeling unprepared, caught off guard, out of control somehow. But we can shift our perspective right in the midst of this falling, losing our balance, losing control, and we can play with what it means to maintain our balance inside of us and touch the resources that we already have that are waiting to be released, to be touched. And this is what we can learn to do individually and also collectively. So there's a poem, a, a, a beautiful reflection from the elders of the Hopi Nation in Oribe, Arizona. And they offer us this wisdom. There is a river now flowing very fast. It is so great and swift that there are those who will be afraid. They will try to hold on to the shore. They will feel they are torn apart and will suffer greatly. Know that the river has its destination. The elders say we must let go of the shore, push off into the middle of the river. Keep our eyes open and our heads above water. And I say, 
see who is in there with you and celebrate. At this time in history, we are to take nothing personally, least of all ourselves. For the moment that we do, our spiritual growth and journey comes to a halt. The time for the lone wolf is over. Gather yourselves. Banish the word struggle from your attitude and your vocabulary. All that we do now must be done in a sacred manner and in celebration. We are the ones we've been waiting for. So there's something very beautiful and hopeful and this emphasis on not fighting this river because we'll we get torn apart. But if we can flow with it, push off into the middle, look around, celebrate who's with us, keep our eyes open, don't get pulled under by our anxiety and our fear and our worry. The river has its destination. We can trust this. We are the ones we've been waiting for. There's some deep wisdom in this teaching. So in times that are really hard, we have what we need. It can feel like we don't. But part of the power of having a spiritual path, having spiritual practices, this encouragement, all that we do now must be done in a sacred manner. That means we need to have a spiritual direction in our lives. Because if we do, we have the tools, we have the, the, the means that are necessary to meet this moment. When I was um, going through a really difficult time as a nun, I was contemplating leaving the monastery and feeling very torn about that, feeling very conflicted after, you know, all of my adult life in the monastery. And that was really all I knew. But I was feeling something else needed to be born. And I was so disturbed by this conflict in me that I, I didn't feel I could actually be in the monastery when we were having Thai's visit and a thousand people were going to attend uh, two retreats, one after another. And I was usually in a, some kind of leadership role. This was in our monastery in Germany. So I asked the sisters, can I please leave? Because I just don't think I can be here with all of the inner conflict that I'm experiencing and needing to you know, maintain this kind of um, elder sister you know, role. So the sister said, well, you should ask Thai, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, we call our teacher, uh, by the Vietnamese word for teacher, which is Thai. And so I went to ask Thai, I said, I can't stay here. I can't be here for this, you know, really big, uh, intense experience. There's too much happening inside. And he was very open and patient and kind, and he listened to me. And he said, well, you can stay. 
He wasn't saying you have to stay. He was just saying you actually have the capacity to stay. He said, this is the time to take refuge in the basic practices of mindful breathing, mindful walking. That was like, you know, the DNA of, of our spiritual practice was being aware in every moment, knowing that you're breathing. In every moment you're breathing, you can always know that you're breathing. Every time you move around and walk, you can know that you're walking. I was so caught up in my predicament that I, I wasn't taking refuge in this basic fundamental practice. And he said, you, you can do that. You can just, whenever you walk around, you know you're walking. When you are breathing, you know you're breathing, and that will see you through. And I was, he transmitted to me the confidence that actually I could stay and that I could take refuge in this basic practice of, of presence. And I did. And I was able to, to be there and, and still hold this conflict, but it didn't overwhelm me because I was walking, knowing I was walking, breathing, knowing I was breathing. So that was a very powerful reminder to me that no matter how dire the situation is, there is something each of us can take refuge in. It's in us. It's not outside of us. We can cultivate that so that it becomes something that's more and more dependable. Our own ability to stay with our discomfort, to pause and feel and experience our Emotions. I learned that research has been done that shows that people who are happy are people who can be with any of their emotions. The difficult, strong, painful, terrifying emotions and the pleasant, beautiful, wonderful emotions that actually people who really are able to manifest their best are the ones who don't hide from their painful emotions, who don't need to run away and escape what's difficult. And that's what that poem was sharing with us about push off into the middle of the river. We can handle these emotions. We don't have to be drowned by them. We don't have to fight them and be pulled apart by them. So there's uh, a teacher, Thomas Hubel, this is from Germany, who talks about climate change and, um, and how there is collective trauma. We, we have individual trauma, we have collective trauma, and that One generation's trauma that wasn't resolved gets frozen like a block of ice and they create trauma for the next generation naturally because they haven't healed their trauma. So that's another block of ice in the next generation and the next and the next and the next. So we have this big block of ice, which is generations of unhealed collective trauma. And he talks about how Underneath all of that ice of unhealed trauma are all the tools that we need to resolve, to, to heal our, um, our diseased relationship with the earth, with each other, with ourselves. So those those. All that wisdom, that insight is already there. We have it. It's available to us. 
if we can turn towards our own pain and suffering and grief and give that space and honor that, not hide from it, not shame it or push it away or project it onto other people, onto other groups of people. But be courageous to meet our own grief and to see ourselves through the eyes of compassion rather than blame and judgment. Because we've inherited these systems that are very traumatizing that we didn't choose, that have been molded by trauma. So having a spiritual path, being able to pay attention to what's going on in our body, that is key. Learning to regulate our nervous system, what we did at the beginning, breathing mindfully, making peace with our bodies. That's an ecological practice. That's a political revolutionary act. Resma Menachem, who wrote the book, My Grandfather's Hands. It's about healing racialized trauma. He speaks of white body supremacy as trauma itself. It doesn't just come from trauma. It doesn't just create trauma. It is trauma. It is a manifestation of trauma, collective trauma. The unearthing of this tragic neglect and abuse that led to the deaths of thousands of First Nations Native children in Canada in boarding schools. That's white-bodied supremacy at work. This unexamined belief that Indigenous lives are not valuable, don't deserve to be protected and cherished. A whole culture blown apart by tearing children from their communities, making languages go extinct, neglecting, starving, abusing children. A fossil fuel lifestyle is also part of that trauma. This consciousness that leads us to gut the earth and extracting consciousness an earth distancing mindset is one that has been traumatized because we don't feel and understand our own belonging. So we can heal this individual and collective trauma with pausing, feeling, returning, to what is happening in this moment. Resma Menachem says one of the fundamental aspects of white supremacy is urgency. Everything needs to happen quickly, quickly. And there's never enough time and time is money. Racialized capitalism racial capitalism, this no time to pause. That's why the pain gets passed from one generation to the next, because there's not taking time to feel and care for and honor and grieve and make amends. Listen to our bodies. And that's what a spiritual orientation, this seeing everything in a sacred manner, that's what that outlook helps us to do. Because when we connect to our bodies, we connect to the earth. We get a felt sense of our belonging 
of our belonging to ourselves, of our belonging to each other, of our belonging to the larger whole, to the earth, to all beings. When we experience that sense of connection, we do whatever we can to protect life. The lives of those we know, but also all of life. And we do whatever we can to live in harmony with, in service of life. Because fundamentally, that's the only thing that creates meaning. That brings real happiness. Is if we see ourselves as the interconnected beings that we are and act like that. So the body, body knows this. The body understands the wisdom of non-self, one of these key teachings of Buddhism. It understands the interbeing nature of all reality. And when we breathe in, we know that the lungs are transporting air to every cell in the body. Each cell doesn't need its own lungs. Imagine if each cell had to breathe for itself. Same with the digestive system. The stomach digests food and transport nutrients to all the cells. What if each cell had to do that for itself? Impossible. Very wasteful. Very inefficient. So just one respiratory system is needed. One digestive system is needed for the whole body to function well. How do we apply that to our lives? Do we each as individuals really need so much stuff? With our devices now, we can do everything by ourselves. We can order food. We can uh, have things delivered to our doorstep without needing anyone. Just whoever is on the other end of that order form, the delivery person. So we are... We are really cut off from each other, each in our own worlds. And there's a pandemic of loneliness of each of us trying to solve all of our issues, meet all of our needs alone. Loneliness is said to be more to, to cause more deaths than heart attacks and high blood pressure. It's, it's, it has a higher correlation with disease than any other condition. So feeling connected to others, having loving relationships, is a key protector of our health, both physical and mental. We are meant to be together in community. This teaching of Ubuntu that our departed ancestor, Bishop Tutu, was so often referring to, I can only be me because you are being you. I can only be me because we exist. I can't be me by myself. So we need to awaken to this insight of interbeing, 
of our interconnectedness more deeply, individually, but also collectively, because we, we cling to our idea of a separate self, of our nation, as a kind of clinging to an idea of a self at the collective level. And that this belief that if I get what I want, that's, that's all I need to worry about, then I'll be safe if I just take care of myself. And so we're in the grips of fear. We're manipulated by fear. That's what a cancer cell does, is it just cares about its own growth rather than the body that's sustaining it. And so we're acting like this in many ways. The, the wealthy, the elite being a kind of cancerous, energy to the whole of humanity and then our whole species being like a cancer to our biosphere a kind of invasive species the writer Daniel Quinn says the rich are like people who live in a fancy penthouse at the top of a hundred story building and every day they send workers down to take some bricks out of the foundation to increase the size of the penthouse. The building has lots of bricks, so this seems harmless enough, but there will come a time when they will have introduced so many holes in the foundation of the building that it will collapse and their position at the top of the tower will not save them. This is what happens in a pandemic when we don't invest in healthcare systems, when we don't protect the people in other countries by making sure they have vaccines. We, we try to take such good care of ourselves, but if we're not taking good care of others in other places, all of the things we're doing to protect ourselves, they, they won't be very effective. So, I want to bring my reflections to a close soon. And I'd like to share two elders' perspectives on why it's important to have hope at this time. One is a Choctaw elder, Stephen Charleston, an indigenous elder. And this is from his book, Ladder to the Light, an indigenous elder's meditations on hope and courage. Stephen Charleston he talks about, he gives the image of the kiva, this very sacred womb-like place of um, sweat lodge. That, that there's a ladder that comes out of the kiva. And he says, the first step up the kiva ladder is the step of trust. Do we trust our own vision? Do we trust in love? Do we trust in a truth greater than ourselves? The answers that we give to these questions are the rung of faith. While we are in the kiva, in the darkness, we begin developing our spiritual vision. Even if we cannot yet see the light, we imagine it. 
We believe in what is not visible, trusting that our own spiritual instincts, our own sense of love and justice will reveal to us a light that can change our reality. That's what Ty was saying to me when he said, you can stay. You might not see this making the, in, the invisible visible. There are, there are things we can trust inside of us. That we may not see them, but we can, we can trust them. We can imagine that they're there. And he says, this is stubborn of spirit. I don't know if I'm spiritual or stubborn or a combination of both. But the more the bad news piles up, the more determined I am to respond to it with the good news I feel so clearly in my mind and heart. Yes, life is hard. It is full of suffering and sorrow. And believe me, I have had my fair share. But life is also beautiful, full of moments that are transcendent in their healing and love. I know because I have been blessed by more of them than I can count. I cannot change the reality of pain or loss, but I can claim the reality of grace and joy. Maybe I'm just stubborn, but I want my last word to be not a complaint, but an alleluia. This is a time of celebration. Hallelujah. We're here. We're alive. We have resources. They are there. Last thing I'll leave you with is the woman who gave me the title to my book. This is Clarissa Pinkola Estes, her letters to a young activist. My friends, do not lose heart. We were made for these times. I have heard from so many recently who are deeply and properly bewildered. They are concerned about the state of affairs in our world now. Ours is a time of almost daily astonishment and often righteous rage over the latest degradations of what matters most to civilized visionary people. You are right in your assessments, yet I urge you, ask you, gentle you, to please not spend your spirit dry by bewailing these difficult times. Especially do not lose hope most particularly because the fact is that we were made for these times. Yes, for years we have been learning, practicing, been in training for, and just waiting to meet on this exact plane of engagement. Thank you for your kind attention. And we'll take a breath together. And uh, we'll transition now to space for you to uh, pose questions. And I do want to just especially center. Uh, BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, People of Color voices. And so we'll hear from you first. So you might make, make it known to us <laughs> so we can uh, prioritize your, your reflections or questions. I think we have about maybe half half an hour or something, Ellie. Is that right? Hello. Yes, we do. And and just to share and um, thank you for your sharing. Also, letting that settle in my body and 
thought I'd just uh, jump out of mute to just warmly invite um, for those of you in the session with us um, that there is a, a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. It says Q&A. And so if you click on that and you'd like to write in a question, we warmly invite your questions in. Um, they'll just be seen by those of us uh, in the in the webinar panel section. So uh, the whole the whole chat won't see them. You can also, if you have a question on your heart that you drop into the chat, we'll see it there also. But you're very welcome to click that Q&A button. Um, and please uh, let us uh, hear your questions and voices. And we have this wonderful time together to co-create um, and to explore with Kyra Jewell. I think there's one question in the chat from Kim, um, and it says, can you say more about white supremacy as trauma? Yes, thank you for this. Uh... So um, one of the things I really appreciate about Resma Menachem's work and shares about this a lot in the book, My Grandmother's Hands. I hope you all read it. <laughs> Many of you probably have already. Um, he talks about how part of what led to the positioning of the white body as the standard against which all other bodies would be judged was um, this need to maintain control in, in uh, this situation of slavery, of indigenous genocide and colonialism. And it and its roots, you know, the roots of being able to see other human beings as not human, which is basically what white supremacy, white bodied supremacy uh, creates. The roots of that he talks about as being rooted in incredible trauma for a thousand years in the medieval times in Europe where um, groups were persecuted and there was public torture as a matter of, you know, it was just there in your, in every time you walked around, people were being uh, severely punished in public and torture was commonplace as a form of Punishment, deterring crime. And so you had generations of Europeans who had experienced being persecuted uh, if they belonged to religious minorities or if they were, you know, lower class. And you had that kind of trauma coming into cultures that weren't European and that unhealed trauma of being victimized or witnessing so much victimization uh, began to be um, enacted on these other cultures. And so um, so the very the very meeting of uh, European cultures and cultures in other places of the world was, um, was an expression of trauma and continued trauma as the slave trade and um, the destroying of native cultures unfolded. So these were traumatized people creating trauma 
Chris Mamenikim talks about blowing their trauma through other bodies. Like they couldn't feel it. They couldn't be with it in their own bodies. So they had to blow it through other bodies. They had to project onto other bodies what they couldn't accept in their own experience. Um, and so, so that's why it's, it is trauma itself. It is an enactment of trauma. Thanks for the question. See, there's some, should I just read a question in the Q&A? Okay. So this says, um, in the face of today's unfolding crises and, and, and injustice, is acting with urgency and sometimes righteous anger the appropriate response? Or does that too easily drift into replicating the very energies that lead to hatred, division, and fear? Thank you for this um, very deep question. You know, um, I'll just answer with the story because uh, this was such a powerful teaching for me from, from my teacher. His picture is right here on the wall. When 9-11 happened, we were uh, on a bus with other monastics driving up to the north of California for Thai to give a lecture to about 3,000 people in Berkeley. And of course, all of us were so shocked to hear the news. And we wanted to right away go into action to prepare a um, press release and to begin to, you know, go to the archives of our press and assemble things that would help Thai respond to this huge crisis. And so a number of us went to Thai when we arrived in Northern California. And we, we said, tomorrow, we asked permission to go into town to start doing this work the next day. And he said, no. He said, uh, we're all going to the beach tomorrow. Because we were right by the beach. And we were a little bit perplexed. Because... <laughs> It wasn't what we were expecting, but it was a very Zen master response that if you're going to have, if you're going to be able to bring something worthwhile in a time of crisis, you have to be very grounded and stable and nourished. And so we spent that next day on the beach we played games, we swam, we ate. And it was very strengthening for what we needed to do after that. And it was very connecting. So we weren't responding out of this um, shock and um, reactivity. I have to do something right away. Because we don't sometimes... Remember I spoke at the beginning about this need to pause? Sometimes we don't actually know what's happened right away. We don't know what's happened inside of us. We don't know what is really going on. And so taking some um, integrating into our responsiveness to the situation, which is urgent, integrating into that the ability to stop and pause and be in our bodies and take in the beauty around us is crucial. If we don't have access to the good, we will get burned out right away. So it's, it's an ability to um, take care every step of the way that we are 
we are going to be in response to what's happening, to the injustice. And we're going to do it in a way that carries in it the seeds of what we want to manifest in the world. If the way we're responding to this urgent situation is full of mm, unprocessed emotion, if it's full of um, anxiety, then what it's going to produce is not ultimately what we want. So the very, um, just, just Ty's teaching, you know, take refuge in your steps, take refuge in your breath. If we can do that in our response to what's happening, then we will manifest something that we actually want. We will manifest more sanity. But if we respond pushed by our, we, the rage is righteous. You, you named it. Righteous anger, it's, it's understandable. But if that is all, sometimes the anger can be the initial impulse, but that can't be the fuel that keeps us going because then we'll, we'll burn out. We may need the anger to get us in response, but then the energy has to come from something deeper, a deeper insight about what will actually help the situation. And that has to do with how we are showing up. Um, this doing things in a sacred manner. That's how we have to respond. What does that mean? That even when we look at our opponent, that we are doing that in a sacred manner, not with hatred, not with violence. Thank you. I'm going to um, read another question. This is a reflection, sorry. As a brown woman, an immigrant in Canada, I've hid my pain and suffering for a long time. I love how you talked about creating space to pause and feel, even if it's feeling the pain. I also feel like the urgency you talked about being white supremacy culture really helped me understand why I feel this need to do more and push more. Taking rest and allowing myself to experience joy and the beauty in life is something I'm working on. Thank you for this wonderful session. I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, and, you know, this... especially as a brown person and a brown woman. This is not uh, pausing and caring for ourselves and caring for our bodies. It's not been part of this culture. The reason Canada, the U.S. is... Uh, is a kind of international power, both of them, is because black and brown and red indigenous bodies have been forced to not take care of themselves. So this is very important what you're talking about and it's so needed and it's not just for you, it's for all of us. When you slow down, when you pause, when you care for yourself, you're helping heal the trauma in the collective consciousness. So just a deep bow to you and that reflection.
So, um, so there's a question, uh, are there discomforts that should be honored? More specifically, the discomforts around social media and our current way of living so quickly. Is not using social media avoidance or a wise choice for some people? So not using social media, is it avoidance or is it a wise choice for some people? Um, so... I think social media is like fire. We can use it for good. We can use it for harm. We can be used by it too. And that's as, you know, people who've been part of creating this uh, culture of devices have reflected that they were made to become addictive. They were made to um, really not support us in, in experiencing our own spaciousness and, um, and health in terms of being in touch with life. Um, so they have, you know, definitely they have transformed our world and in some ways for good and in many ways um, not for good. And so again, this, how do we use these technologies, social media in a sacred manner? What does that mean? How do we take care of our bodies and our minds and include pausing as we engage with these technologies? Can we, can we be moderate in our use of them? Can we be intentional in our use of them? Can we notice how they're affecting us? For some people, it may very well be better to really confine that to a very small part of their lives. I think it's very good to have fasts of technology, technological sabbaticals, and really see what happens when your mind isn't constantly being stimulated and your fingers aren't always swiping. I, uh, I taught teen retreats with the Inward Bound Mindfulness Education and, uh, and other, many of the retreats I lead also for adults. We invite people to surrender their cell phones at the beginning of the retreat. But for the teen retreats, definitely, it's not, not a choice. <laughs> it's required. So they have this like, withdrawal for the first day where they're like oh my god i have to like look at other people and talk to other people <laughs> can i hide behind my phone but then all of this you know interpersonal connection begins to happen and they begin to connect with themselves because of the meditation and the, the mindful eating the mindful walking and then we do this ceremony at the end of the retreat where before we give them back the phone, we meditate together. We, we, we feel how our bodies are. What's it feel like to know we're going to get our phones back? We turn our phones on together, still in meditation. And we, we see what it's like to mindfully open one text or open one email and that's it. We notice what it feels like in the body. When you see all the colors, you see all 
the options of things you can do on your phone. So we slow it down and we, we get in touch with what are the emotions, what are the intentions, what are the motivations that we have? And how can we engage with that mindfully, compassionately? So that's possible. I mean, that could be an interesting practice. Maybe a group could come together regularly to, what does it mean to engage with our technology mindfully? How can we support each other? How can we resist the ways that we become enslaved by these gadgets? So I think moderation and mindfulness and looking at how to be sacred with our use of technology. And the German author I mentioned is Thomas Hubel. Thomas Hubel who talked about collective trauma. So here's a question. Uh, I was wondering if you had any guidance on striking a balance between feeling our emotions and being with them individually, especially grief and loss, and sharing them with the community and, and collectively without mirroring or projecting our struggles onto people. So sometimes things that we feel are individual may be collective, may not just be from our lifetime, but maybe from our parents or our previous generations of ancestors. And certainly, what's so traumatizing about our society is that a lot of the historical roots of our experience now are hidden and decontextualized. And so we think we're the ones that are somehow at fault or weak or that that these experiences are ours alone individually. But I also see what you're not wanting to project what is yours onto a group. Um, And I think open communication can really be supportive of asking for help, saying this is something I'm grieving, I'm struggling with. I could use support. If this isn't, if my struggle isn't your collective struggle, I don't want to project it onto you. But if I'm among you as a member of your community and I'm struggling and I'm grieving, that's going to affect the community. And so having support, having a way to hold that together can really be supportive. And I remember Ty encouraging us when I was a nun to invite others to join us in a circle to hold us in our suffering. So if something was too much for us that we shouldn't try to hold it alone, but we should ask others to be part of a compassionate circle of, of deep listening to us and just not feeling alone in what we are carrying.
So what, what I've been talking about in this talk, so much of the things that are the reasons for grief are the, you know, this river moving so fast. That's not meant to be held alone. One body is not enough to hold all of that. Generations of of unhealed trauma. We need to do this collectively. And so being with others to, to be held and to help to hold each other is um it's essential. And you know, communities. When we practice, there's wisdom and people will help us. If we're projecting, they can help us see, no, no, that's, that's maybe you can, you can add something to your perception to see it more clearly. So we can ask for help and we can give each other feedback, but we do need each other to do this work of seeing clearly and healing together. We're not meant to hold this by ourselves. As you're looking at the questions, I'll just jump in. Perhaps we have time for one more and then we can offer some concluding remarks, which will also uh, share some resources that we've collected to share with all of you and also to really support uh, what Kyra Jewel was just sharing, which is how can we continue the conversation and not do this alone? So I'll pass it back to you and then offer some uh, final coming together for today uh, that will include some of our community building that we hope to continue. So this is a, a question. How do I, as a non-white colonized person, endure the suffering? A Palestinian mother whose husband, six-year-old daughter, and 10-year-old son have been incarcerated by the Zionist occupation that has demolished her ancestral home to make way for Jewish illegal settlers. Thank you for this question. Um, so, that's a, a great, great suffering that you're bringing to us. And I invite us all to hold this suffering with um, deep respect and honoring that this is happening in this moment. People are being forced off of their lands and enduring great injustice and hardship. And what this teaching of interbeing tells us is that we are those being pushed off their land, and we are also those who are pushing others off of their land. We are the children. who were starved and abused in Canadian boarding schools. And we are those responsible for their care who abused them. We have to look deeply to see that those who are creating oppression they don't come out of a vacuum. 
they experienced great suffering too. You know, were victims of ignorance and violence and insecurity and fear. And so while we need to look at what we can do to be of support to those enduring such grave hardship, caring about these things, sending money, being part of organizations that are supporting Palestinians. I get emails from Jewish Voices for Peace that is as a Jewish organization supporting those in Palestinian occupied territories. So we, we do what we can and if we can't do much, we can hold this uh, beloved human and her family in our hearts and remember them and pray for them, meditate, sending them energy and support. And this wisdom of interbeing also says that the path ultimately is to also be able to do the same for those that are causing this destruction, to hold them in our hearts, to pray, to, to hold in our minds and hearts the possibility of them transforming, the possibility of the world waking up to this situation and creating a different reality. And so what does that mean in this situation? We are the ones we have been waiting for. We were made for these times. How do we take that as encouragement that we have something to offer to a situation like this? We can be proactive. We can be a source of compassion for the intense suffering that's endured on all sides. Injustice is happening, that is true. And suffering is happening on all sides. So thank you for this opportunity to reflect in this way. Thank you, Kara Jewel, for joining us to open and hold space and for everyone, uh, over a hundred of us having spent this time together to hold space, to listen, to share. For each of you who has offered a question into the space and perhaps each of you who has a question in your heart that hasn't offered it, but that it's there. I just really want to thank everyone for their time and energy. You know, from a neuroscience perspective, attention is a limited resource. So thank you for sharing that resource with us. I'm going to take the next few minutes uh, just to offer some thanks uh, to some of the folks who have helped us bring this together and also to share with all of you some further resources. I also want to honor some questions that we haven't gotten to that I will take note of and share with our next speakers that we have this beautiful opportunity to keep coming together. Um, we aren't just coming together this one time. Uh, so a really warm invitation to please uh, come back home uh, to yourselves and to us. Uh, next month, we have Joe Riley joining us. And Joe is a singer, songwriter, social worker, activist, educator, uh, who will bring more reflection and song to this, this sangha, this community that we are manifesting in these webinars. Um, I also want to mention an event coming uh, this Monday from uh, some organization at New College where our program is hosted. Um, we'll share it in the link, but it is a called Females on the Front Line in Solidarity for Water. And it's with the Water Allies uh, for a panel of discussion with five indigenous women who are in solidarity with the Wet'suwet hereditary chiefs and their struggle against the coastal gas pipeline. So we just want to mention this event is coming Monday and I'll share the link for that uh, in the chat in a moment. 
We also want to share with you some resources we've collected for further spaces for connection and conversation. Um, although we are online, we also have these chances to come together. Um, so I'll ask Sam to drop in and you would have received an email beforehand that has these resources. And just a warm kind of thank you to our community of co-sponsors, uh, the School of the Environment, Faculty of Law, OISE Wellness at the University of Toronto have been part of this series. And it's really wonderful to have these kind of cross-faculty departmental conversations to welcome all our voices into this space. And also the Academy of Mindfulness and Contemplative Studies at the University of Ottawa. And again, a thank you to the New Colleges Initiative Fund for encouraging us to put things together. And also, hello to all my students who are here. It's wonderful also to see you. Um, so with that, I think we are kind of wrapping up our time. And again, thank you for taking the time to be here. And we hope this is just the start of building connection and community. Um, I was looking at the registration page before we started today, and I could see just folks from all over the world joining us from many different spaces. Um, so thank you so much for that. And uh, Kyra, Jewel, or Francis, if there's anything else you'd like to add before we close the session, I just wanted to invite you both back in. Just thank you so much for this time and uh, holding you in my heart. And, you know, I'm in your heart too. Thank you.